and welcome to the lecture on chapter 23, The Death of Stars. We've been leading up to this chapter all right, by talking about the life cycle of stars as illustrated in this Hubble telescope image of a section of the sky showing stars being born from a nebula, from a molecular cloud, stars burning in, in a large phase, but in the mean sequ main sequence. And here we have a picture of a star actually is shedding huge amounts of mass as it dies, okay? As it, as it reaches its final stage, okay? Um, we don't see a lot of kind of long-lived red stars in this case, but here, you know, this would be focusing on the life cycle of high mass stars. You know, these ones, like I said, burning bright and blue with their short life cycles. But regardless, there are commonalities between life cycles, okay? That said, we're gonna start by focusing on the life cycle of low mass stars, okay? And specifically, since this chapter is all about the death of stars, and we already kind of talked about what happens in old age, okay? That was the last chapter. Where, how, how are stars born? That was the chapter before. So now we're specifically focusing on that final stage, the aftermath of a star that stops undergoing fusion. In particular, that is the overarching idea of this chapter. What happens when the star runs out of fuel and can no longer fuse elements? That nuclear process of fusion cannot be sustained forever, okay? And it runs out, okay? And we're going to be then dividing our discussion, as we've done before, between low mass stars and high mass stars, kind of a, a binary distinction. And there's, it's a continuum in reality. There's a lot of behavior. It's complicated, but we can group, coarsely group, stars into low mass stars like our star, you know, it's smaller and larger, but in that range around, around our sun. And then high mass stars that are 20, 30, 40 times bigger um, in mass, more massive than our sun. Furthermore, we're going to talk about what happens to white dwarfs, which is one of the categories we're going to introduce when they're in a binary system, because that's a very particular set of rules and interesting ideas. And then lastly, we're going to finish up with talking about these particular events which are related to the deaths of stars, or at least the something that can happen to stars after they die, all right, when they're just a corpse. And we'll talk about that in the final section. So I'm gonna to try to move through these, these ideas in a succinct manner because there are quite a few distinct ideas, but I also wanna make sure that I cover all the important details and don't leave anything out, okay? But that said, I'm gonna try not to you know, kind of go off on a tangent, but instead relate these core ideas, all right? Because you have to remember that it's all about the death of stars. And we'll start with this figure, okay? What are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at white dwarfs, okay? What are white dwarfs? White dwarfs are the corpse of low mass stars. That is what our sun will become, okay? So, after the planetary nebula, after, after the red giant, once a star like our sun has finished fusion completely, it'll become some sort of white dwarf, okay? And when we look at white dwarfs, they are going to vary in their density depending on how massive they are. Basically what was left over when, this, when the star stopped doing fusion. Okay, so when we look here, we see that on the vertical axis is the radius of the white dwarf, okay? They're quite small. Notice this is in solar radii. So white dwarfs at their largest are about 2% the size of our sun, okay? So they're much, much smaller. They're like planet-sized, they're earth-sized, because in a sense, they're just the leftover core of what used to be the star. And as they become more massive, as the star that, that created the white dwarf becomes more massive and thus its core is more massive, we see that the size of the white dwarf approaches zero as the mass approaches 1.4, okay? And this does present an issue, all right? And in fact, scientists like this Indian American scientist, Chandrasekhar, who worked in the early half of the 20th century, all right, early to mid half of the 20th century, found the connections and made the key steps, the conceptual theoretical steps of saying, well, what happens after we hit 1.4 solar masses for the remaining core? How do we make sense of the rules that are gonna govern 
star corpses. What's left? How do we how do we address the fundamental physics of gravity and electrons and quantum mechanics in a way that makes sense and is consistent with astronomy that is observable that is testable? Okay, and certainly we have here that much really the founding one of the founding fathers, one of the founding members because you know they gender aside is Chandrasekhar. All right, okay, lived from 1910 to 1995. Okay, so to, cut, to tie things together with, with what we've seen about geriatrics of stars, and, and again, this is still low mass stars. From the previous chapter, we saw that there, there was a phase where the stars, like our sun, went through basically becoming a red giant and then, start, and then becoming very large, then becoming smaller again, Become, then becoming a helium star, stable for a short amount of time, just, thousand, thousand, just a few thousand or million years, and then eventually running out of the helium fusion, not having enough um, basically heat to fuse heavier elements, and then eventually just shedding about 50% of the mass of the star. All right, so about 50% of the mass, and this is happening kind of right here at that planetary nebula stage. Okay. All right, this is becomes a, when this is the picking up where we left off in the discussion in the previous chapter. And we say out, and we point out here that after the star becomes a giant again, it will lose more and more mass and its core begins to collapse. There's just not there's nothing left. There's just not enough pressure to keep that core fusing the heavier elements and to keep it hot enough to fuse those heavier elements. Because remember, fusion requires a lot of kinetic energy of the atoms, and if it's just not there, then fusion won't happen. All right, and then the inner core gets exposed. And so this process here, going in B, is basically that process of just the inner core getting left behind. And then once the core is left behind and we get to point C, it is now a white dwarf. And that white dwarf just continues to lose luminosity and starts to cool, okay? Because at first, when the core gets left behind, there's a huge heat up. Right here, it's getting hotter because that core is being exposed, it's losing a lot of heat as, as it's being exposed, as, as the mass that was shielding that core before is just being shed off, okay? Because from the huge amount of energy, basically from the gravitational collapse, because at this point the core is becoming smaller and smaller, it's shrinking down to the size of a planet, right? And thus producing a huge amount of energy from that gravitational potential energy becoming heat, but then that can't last forever. That is very much a transient one-time process, not like fusion that can run for billions of years. And so thus, then we reach this stage of the white dwarf, okay? And then the white dwarf will ultimately end up kind of somewhere here on the HR diagram. Because of course, that's what we're looking at here, luminosity versus sur surface temperature. This is the HR diagram, which we always use as a reference for so much of our discussion on stars, okay? And white dwarfs can kind of end up anywhere in this, this region here on the diagram. That's their final resting place. There they are, they're a white dwarf, okay? And white dwarfs are interesting. They're not very luminous at all. I mean, we saw, we can see right on the diagram, they have luminosity, which is quite a bit less bright than, than kind of a standard star. They're, they would be in that category of hard to see stellar objects like um, like brown dwarfs, right? Those stars that never really started or just the very small red giant or um, red, red stars, not red giants, but the very, star, very small red main sequence stars. So we see here, this is an example of how faint a white dwarf is compared to a main sequence star, all right? And so that's that tiny little dot over here is the white dwarf just producing a very small amount of visible light. Um, this is a similar image here at lower resolution and it's zoomed out a bit. So we've zoomed out, but notice here, now this is the white dwarf. And it looks like now the white dwarf is the brighter of the two stars. And that's because image B here is an X-rays. So white dwarfs, the type of light they produce is very faint in the visible spectrum and their luminosity is low, but they do produce a lot of one particular wavelength of light and that is X-rays. And again, that, that's just a testament to their the way that they're, they're still, the only way they're even still glowing, because there's no fusion occurring in this corpse, all right? The corpse that is the white dwarf. There's no fusion going on. 
all the energy is just left over. It's just, it's just that final gravitational collapse. Really, it's just a cooling process. It's just the leftover heat and, and a huge amount of it that came from that gravitational collapse and that heat is just being radiated away. And one way it's radi radiated away due to the particular physical processes that generated in the first place at the, at the atomic scale is through x-rays. Okay, and that's why the white doors definitely shine bright in the x-ray spectrum, all right? So the thing about white dwarfs is because they just have leftover heat, they definitely, they just, they don't, they don't last forever. And eventually they will cool and they, they'll form something called a black dwarf. So all white dwarfs become black dwarfs. Now this takes billions of years. It may have never happened yet in the age of the universe. But in another 100 billion years, you know, maybe 10 times the current age of the universe, the models that scientists have show us that these will eventually cool. The white dwarfs, which are quite common because they come from a very common type of star, stars like our sun, they will eventually cool. They'll lose all their heat because it's not sustainable. And they'll just be left a leftover cool husk called a black dwarf that is black in the sense that it's not creating any light. It could reflect some light from a nearby star, but that's it. It is no longer emitting any light. It is cooled down, it will cool down to very, very low temperatures, eventually you know, approaching a, you know, its you know, temperatures near absolute zero, right? as it just becomes a cool solid. Now the thing is you might think, oh, well in that case, is it just kind of like a planet? Is it like a rock? Well, in a sense it is, it would be like a crystal. It would be a solid. Its, its phase would be something, something like a solid, but also, it would have such incredible density that you couldn't, you couldn't land on it, not because the heat would kill you, but the gravity would kill you because it's so dense that the gravitational acceleration on its surface would be crushing, crushing to anything, including life, but even, even mechanical devices. Because I mean, we're talking about accelerations that are 10,000 or 100,000 times greater than gravitational acceleration. Imagine being 100,000 times heavier you would liquefy. And, that, and that's, that's, the, that's the reality of how much gravitational pull these leftover stellar corpses have, okay? Even once they're cooled. Um, furthermore, a key idea about white dwarfs, a um, key idea before we move on, because this is going on to high mass stars, a key final idea about white dwarfs, and I'm gonna write it over here, is that what what prevents them from collapsing further? Because this wants to be, this, this is an idea that we're gonna kind of come back to. What, what prevents a white dwarf from just collapsing forever? Why does the core even stay there? Because before we had the premise, the theory that's backed up by observation that stars push back against the crushing force of gravity due to the internal outward pressure created from the fusion that's occurring inside of them. It creates an equilibrium, a gravitational equilibrium. It's balanced, okay? So when that equilibrium fails, once the star runs out of matter to fuse, then we end up with this low mass star death and the white dwarf. But then what holds the white dwarf together if there's no fusion? It is something called electron degeneracy. And electron degeneracy is a big idea. It will mention neutron degeneracy. We can't get into the details of it. It's a quantum mechanical idea. But what it says is that two electrons cannot be in the same place at the same time. So it is an electron, electron push. It, and it's based on what are these things called matter waves, which is the idea that at the fundamental level, Matter is a wave, just like light is a wave. This is very much true. Matter has been proven to be a wave in many, many experiments. And thus, there is a wave interference that occurs for these wave particles that we know as electrons. And when they're pushed together so close to each other, and they're forced in such cl close proximity due to the incredible density of these white dwarf stellar corpses, these husks of leftover stars, then what prevents the star from collapsing further is electron degeneracy, a quantum mechanical pressure, okay? But of course, that degeneracy only works up to a certain number because then the rules change, all right? And that's where you have scientists, great minds who come in and say, well, what happens then, right? Do we break physics? No, there must be another explanation. What is it? How do we test it? 
how do we find other theories that support it? Okay? Okay, so that's a good segue into stars that break the rules. Stars that have too much gravity, or so much gravity, that they would overcome electron degeneracy, that outward pressure pushing from electrons. Okay? And that takes us to high mass stars. All right? Now, high mass stars, we already mentioned, go through a much more complicated geriatrics phase. They don't just get to a point where maybe they fuse a little bit of oxygen. They definitely fuse lots of elements all the way up to the end. And what's the end of the line? Iron. Okay? So this is the onion, very cartoonish, not, you know, not entirely to scale picture, right? It says, note the diagram is not precisely to scale, right? These layers are not perfect, but there are layers of fusion, all right? Layers of hydrogen fusion, helium fusion, carbon and oxygen fusion, neon fusion, oxygen fusion, silicon and sulfur fusion, and finally, an inert iron core, all right? Now, interestingly, with these heavy stars, as they actually go through and they, they start fusing subsequent layers of heavier and heavier elements, the, the time frame becomes that quite, quite remarkably different between, between those heavy elements. And what's that, you know, so what's actually happening as, as these, high, these high mass stars are fusing these, these heavier elements, we get up to a point where, where silicon and sulfur fusion will only last for days. So this phase where the, the high mass star is actually fusing, actively fusing and, and generating energy and thus pushing back against its, its outer layers, because this is a star that still has a huge amount of inert outer layer, you know, and basically the convection layer of the star, that when the core is, is getting most of its energy from fusing silicon and sulfur, it's not, it's not years, it's not millions of years, not at all. It's just days because it's such, it's such an a unstable process because what happens is as heavier and heavier elements get fused up to iron, there's less and less energy generated from the fusion. And so the fusion has to be going at an incredibly high rate and thus is burning through that fuel, which there wasn't as much to begin with because after all, the silicon and sulfur that is there to be fused, <clears throat> excuse me, was produced as a byproduct of previous fusion levels. And so there's less and less of it because the so star started with almost entirely being hydrogen, okay? So furthermore, the energy per fusion process is smaller because there's a rule in physics that tells us that as we go from elements from hydrogen to iron, the energy per fusion becomes less and less. And iron is the end product which is the most stable element in the universe. And as such, since it's the most stable element, you cannot produce energy from either the fission, the breaking apart of a iron nucleus, nor the fusion of two iron nuclei. It, there is no energetically favorable process to do anything with the atom of iron. It is the end product. If you were to start with uranium, and, can, and just break apart elements you'd event, and try to get energy from breaking them apart, you'd eventually end up with iron if you just continue to break apart those heavier elements. Now, it doesn't happen in nuclear power plants because we, we get to a point where it doesn't make sense to break apart the, the byproducts of even you know, plutonium fusion. And so then we just leave that as radioactive waste. But you could continue to break, it, break those elements apart until you get a little bit of energy per, per fission, per, break, per breaking event, until you eventually reach iron. Likewise, with fusion, elements can continue to be fused together. Stars will do it because of the huge press, the huge out, the downward, inward pressure of gravity, but they'll eventually stop at iron, okay? So iron is the end of the line, and for stars, it's the end of the fusion line, the most stable element in the universe, okay? So this is the onion core of high mass stars, all right? Now, this is kind of a throwback to the material before because now we care about what happens when that star dies. Well, when high mass stars die, they don't just gradually shed their, because notice we never talked about any explosion of low mass stars. There was just a planetary nebula, a gradual loss of about 50% of the matter, and eventually a core was left behind. But high mass stars, it's much more dramatic. High mass stars experience a supernova, okay? And they experience what's called a type two supernova. So a high mass supernova is a type two supernova. We'll talk about type one supernovas later. And historically, it probably makes sense to call these 
type 1, but they, it wasn't known what they were historically when they were discovered, thus the name type 2 stuck around. All right, so it's a type 2 supernova. These are explosions of a high mass star, releasing a huge amount of energy. Why is there an explosion? There's an explosion, explosion because at some point the, the core, that inner iron core, starts to have so much inward pressure that it tries to fuse the iron. Since that actually uses up more energy, it creates the, uh, basically an, an iron catastrophe. So now because it, the, fusing of, the fusing of energy or the fusing of the iron is actually ca then causing the core to collapse even faster than it would under gravity, this means that then there's a, a cataclysmic collapse which then releases a huge amount of energy blasting away the outer, outer onion layers of the core and the entire convection um, and um, you know, just the rest of the star above it, the, all the layers above the core, just being blasted away in um, a fraction of a second, okay? And then that matter accelerates away at about half the speed of light, basically this, this, this blast of gas um, being accelerated away. During, um, during that blast, there's a huge amount of energy being released just because we have particles racing away at half, half the speed of light. They're emitting, they're emitting energy of on the, like the X-ray um, X ray wavelength. Um, we have, they're, and they're so hot that they're basically radiating the energy as a hot gas. So there's emission occurring, an X-ray emission. There's also going to be um, examples of radio wave emission. The radio wave emission is usually created by the, actually, the acceleration of very fast electrons. So you have really hot gases that are, that are emitting in the X-ray. They're, they're acting like sort of um, black body radiation. So they're emitting according to their heat in X-rays. And then we have racing fast electrons that are operating like antennae and actually then creating radio waves. In the, in the meantime, we also have some visible light being produced, in this case kind of yellow light, pockets of it due to particular interactions. It tends to be localized. But the, the fact is that we have these, these blasts, these, these bubbles of exploding high mass stars that then we can see in the galaxy and in other galaxies. And they, they're, they're quite remarkable because they're, the scale of them, they spread out. You know, this one here, it has a diameter of 14 light years and it was first documented 400 years ago. So in 400 years, that cloud is spread out over, four, over 14 light years, which is just amazing to think that, we, that something could, that big could be formed in that little time because 400 years is not that much time. A 14 light year diameter for a, something that wasn't there before is huge. I mean, it's unbelievably huge. Again, I mean, thinking about just three light years, three light years is, is so far that currently it would take a spacecraft that we've developed 40,000 years to travel three light years, right, by man-made spacecraft. Imagine something that is 14 light years across that, only, that was entirely created in only 400 years. Right, so the, the speeds of these, these gases, the energy that's being released is, is so otherworldly, right? So beyond the scope of the experiences that we have in our own solar system, which is good. It's good that we don't have a supernova next door that's going to blow up. It would, it would wipe away our, our atmosphere, okay, as the x-rays bombarded our planet, okay? So this, that's the dramatic death of those high mass stars as their, as their core collapses all right, and they're, they're blowing off, all right? They can be so bright that we can see them, a, see a single star in a distant galaxy, all right? So we have one, one star showing up so much that we can pick it out from another 100 billion stars that populate that galaxy. I mean, think about that, that that one star is so bright that its brightness compares to the sum brightness of 100 billion stars that are just you know, burning normally and not just blowing up. It just shows you how much energy is released in a type two supernova. The, the dramatic explosion of a high mass star, okay? When it, when it runs out of fuel to fuse. All right, here's another, another picture of a supernova showing the kind of the spreading cloud around it, a disk of matter around, around the supernova, supernova remnants, okay? Here's another example of supernova remnants. This one's neat because it was taken um, a few years apart and the ring of gas that's spreading out from the supernova at first is, is not that bright, and so the light it's emitting is more red in terms of the, um, the emission spectrum. And then a few years later, it's white. And that's because basically there's two waves. This, this wave was produced earlier, the wave that is creating this ring, and then a faster secondary wave has caught up and then started interacting with the gas, thus heating it up, making it glow white. 
right? So it's kind of, it's really cool to see that and then think about the models that scientists are fitting and, and how that matches the behavior because it's a pretty direct observation, okay? So when we look at supernovas, their brightness doesn't last that long. It's only gonna last maybe you know, one Earth year or you know, a little bit more in terms of when we're really gonna notice it in the sky. So we can see here apparent visual magnitude. Supernovas can be so bright that they can have um, a, an apparent, apparent visual magnitude as bright as the brightest stars, you know, somewhere around like two or three, right? So they'd be like the brightest star, star in the night sky. Remember that essentially the brightest stars are in that right around zero in apparent magnitude, which is that backwards logarithmic scale. And then over, over a couple of years, they'll dim down until they, they're not visible anymore to the naked eye, okay? It's an example of, of supernovas, they'll show up, there'll be a new star, a noticeable star in the night sky for a couple of years, and then they'll fade. Does this happen every year? Certainly not, okay? This is something that might happen once in a human lifetime, just because of you know, proximity of, of high mass stars that are gonna be dying, okay? But when it happens, it's definitely a noteworthy thing that you can go out and observe if you're lucky enough to be around when it's happened. And there's been, there's been cases where supernovas are even closer, such as the one that was documented 400 years ago, this one here. Um, that one was so bright that it would have been by far the brightest observation, and it would have been visible in the, mor the morning and the evening, just like the moon is. It was so, so bright that, um, that morning sunlight and evening sunlight would have, you know, it would have showed up, okay? Or maybe, you know, kind of like Venus is visible right, right at sunrise or right at sunset because it's such a bright planet in terms of the reflected light from Venus. Um, but same thing, same thing with the supernova. It was so bright. So its apparent magnitude would have been in the negative scale. It actually would have been something like this. Okay, but that's rare. That's just due to the proximity of that particular supernova and its size because there's a large range. You know, they can, well, these are stars that are blowing up that are 20 times the mass, mass of the sun, 40 times the mass of the sun, even 50 or 60 in rare cases. All right, so there's obviously very different energies associated with those different mass, high mass stars. All right, um, here we can see um, X ray emissions coming from. Coming from the explosion of a supernova, that ring of, of gas racing away from the, the husk, the leftover husk, um, and then a, and jets will form, jets perpendicular to the ring, um, where you have matter and, atom, at, matter and antimatter electrons um, moving at half the speed of light, creating interactions, producing light. Um, there's there's a, you know, a strong magnetic field which, in, which uh, creates these jets, so it's kind of a disk and jet effect. We'll see that, we'll see that in another phenomenon disk and jet effect, okay? So one thing um, that I wanna make clear about um, high mass stars is that when they blow up, right, the supernova, they do leave something behind, okay? And one thing they leave behind is called a neutron star, okay? And in fact, um, if you look here, uh, what we're seeing is something called a pulsar. And we're just about to talk about that. That's the, the lighthouse here, it's, um, and it's an analogy. And a pulsar is, is a leftover corpse of a high mass star supernova. So, okay, so as when the low mass star dies, what does it leave behind? A white dwarf. When the high mass star dies, it's supernovas, dramatic event in itself, big bright thing we can see in the sky, but it also leaves something behind, okay? It leaves behind a neutron star, okay? And a neutron star is a pulsar. There are two names for the same thing, okay? Pulsars are neutron stars, neutron stars are pulsars, okay? We can't see all neutron stars. We'll talk about why that is, okay? Because the way, the way they kind of emit, emit energy, they emit um, light, um, but neutron stars are the corpse of a high mass star death, okay? <clears throat> and the idea about neutron stars is that they spin and they emit light along a particular axis that is spinning. So a neutron star is like a beam of light that is spinning around. Well, what's the best way to imagine that, to visualize that? A lighthouse, like a beam of light that's spinning around, right? That's what lighthouses do, that's what neutron stars do, okay? And here's, here's the, like the kind of the cartoon picture of the neutron star, all right? Now again, they're called pulsars. They're called pulsars because they appear to pulse to astronomers on Earth. Because what happens is this beam of particles passes over Earth, we see it as a bright pulse, then the star turns away, right? It takes, it takes a few, few days for that light to come back, because you know, here we are, right? The light's gonna pass over Earth. And then until we get that next beam, 
it's basically, we can't see the neutron star, it's invisible. Because what happens is the neutron star has such a strong magnetic field that, what's ha that basically all of its light energy is being emitted along these poles. It's kind of like the aurora borealis on Earth, but on a much more powerful scale. And of course the aurora borealis, the northern lights, is the idea of, of electrons being, and other charged particles, being directed along the magnetic poles of our planet, and then those electrons then emitting light through interactions with the atmosphere, okay? So here we have electrons being forced along a particular axis with the magnetic field, that, that's the red lines here, the magnetic field. We have two magnetic poles, a north and a south pole. Those charged particles are forced along the magnetic field lines, they're forced along the pole. Those charged particles then produce light due to the physical processes of accelerating charged particles, something called electromagnetic induction. And as they produce light, then that's, that's the light we see, that's the pulse. Now the weird thing about pulsars is that this magnetic north and south pole is not aligned with the rotation axis. Because if you think about our own planet, our own planet is like this, this, um, this dynamo, all right? It's an electrodynamic, electrodynamic dynamo, it's like a motor. And the magnetic field then has to exist along the rotation axis because that's the only way that the magnetic field can be created is by the spinning core of our planet. So of course it has to be aligned along the rotation, rotation axis. Well, neutron stars are more like permanent magnets. They're more like a magnet you would, you would like stick to your fridge or you know, use to hold something together. And as a permanent magnet, the, pole, the poles of that magnet are not aligned along the axes of the rotation. And instead, that magnet spins. Are they always aligned exactly 90 degrees? 90 degrees like shown in this picture? Definitely not. And furthermore, the, the misalignment between the magnetic field and the rotation, rotational axis of the neutron star does eventually degrade. And then the, new, the neutron star will eventually have a aligned magnet, magnetic field and over just a few ten thousands of years. It's, it's not a permanent process. Neutron stars are losing energy as well, um, just like white dwarfs, because there's just like white dwarfs, neutron stars have no fusion, okay? They're just a leftover corpse of what was a star that was undergoing fusion. And so, okay, but then that begs the question, why are they called neutron stars? How, are they like white dwarfs? You know, where, why, do, why do they glow at all? They are. And the idea is what prevents the neutron star from collapsing, and this is the same argument that we made for the white dwarf, what prevents the neutron star from collapsing is not electron degeneracy, but neutron degeneracy, okay? And the idea there is it's another quantum mechanical process. It's the idea that the two neutrons cannot be in the same place at the same time. So that would be a neutron, neutron push. Okay, so neutrons are neutral. So, so neutron, neutron push. It's neutrons that get push against the neutrons. The idea is that the electrons eventually couldn't push back against gravity. Remember there was electrons that were holding gravity at bay for the white dwarf. And there was that critical mass of 1.4 solar masses for the core, the white dwarf, okay, the leftover core we call the white dwarf. Well, when, once you hit 1.4, you hit that point where the radius, according to the model of white dwarfs and electron degeneracy approaches zero, but it doesn't because there's another thing that can fight against gravity and that is the very nature of neutrons. What happens on a physical level is the electrons and the protons, because there always, there always was a bunch of leftover protons in this incredibly dense plasma, because it's essentially what white dwarfs, white dwarfs are. They're like an incredibly dense plasma. So eventually those electrons fuse with the protons. They can't push back anymore and they actually push into the protons. When the electrons become one with the protons, they become neutrons. So now the only thing to fight against gravity is the neutrons pushing against neutrons, which is a very strong force, even stronger than the electron pushback. And that, that neutron force means that now the neutron star has become a whole new type of matter. It's not a plasma anymore because it's not an ionized gas, even a super exotic, super dense plasma. It is an entirely different state of matter. It is a state of matter which is just solid neutrons. There's nothing else. There's no protons, there's no atoms. It's just solid neutrons. And that's what neutron stars are made of. It is the densest mat known matter in the universe. Uh, it's, it's hard to fathom how dense it is. It's pure neutron matter, okay? And again, because of this quantum mechanical process that the neutrons don't want to, 
fuse together. They can't. They have nowhere else to go. They push back against gravity. Okay. Now, if you're wondering, is there a, is there a failure point? Is there is there a, a point where the neutrons can't push back? Do all high mass stars become neutron stars? Do they all become pulsars? No. Some high mass stars die in such a cataclysmic way and they leave so much mass left in their core that their core collapses into a neutron star for just a fraction of a second and then the neutron star fails. The neutron degeneracy cannot maintain the gravitational push and then that star collapses into a black hole. Okay? And that is, will be the topic of the next chapter. We have something else we'll, we'll wrap up. We have a couple topic, topics we'll finish up in this chapter. But ultimately, you can look forward to discussing black holes in the next chapter. Because that's what happens when high mass stars don't become neutron stars. They become black holes. There might be something in between. There might be other states. If you ever heard of something called a quark, a quark are, is the building blocks of protons and neutrons. They're subatomic particles. So it's possible, although it's never been discovered, that there are quark stars quark stars that exist in the universe, uh, which would be an even denser form of matter, pure quark matter. But we're not sure. We're not sure if quarks have a degeneracy in the same way, or if when a neutron star fails, it goes straight to a black hole. Okay? Um, black, black holes have, have a lot of fascinating um, aspects to them, um, so, but we'll get to those in there in due time. Okay? <clears throat> So pulsars, um, because of the leftover energy, can be, have a huge amount of kind of a trans, um, translational velocity. They can kind of be flying off in one direction, especially when the explosion of the supernova was not exactly lined up. It's, it's not necessarily perfectly symmetric. And so that, that leftover core can fly off in one direction while, while pulsing, of course, while spinning and being incredibly dense. And it can actually leave this trail of charged particles, glowing hot charged particles behind it. All right, so here we have a trail that's 37 light years across, just like flying through space. So, I mean, just, just imagine, right, this, this neutron star just flying by other, other ordinary stars, just being like, whoa, look at it go, you know? All right. Okay, so last two ideas here. Wait, now, we've introduced the two types of stellar corpses, white dwarfs and neutron stars. And you might think, oh, we're done, right? High mass stars make neutron stars. Low, ma low mass stars make white dwarfs, okay? One of them is, is maintained by... Neutron degeneracy, a quantum mechanical pressure. The other is maintained by electron degeneracy, also a quantum mechanical pressure, both pushing back against gravity. And that's a nice story in itself. But there's one other <clears throat> really important topic and then one other kind of side topic we have to cover. And that's what's, what happens when white dwarfs are in a binary star system. And that might be seen like, oh, why do we care? You know, this is a binary star system. Well, remember half of star systems in our galaxy, and it's probably common in most galaxies, are binary star systems. So binary star systems are, you know, very common. Half, you know, half stars, half of stars are in them, and so that means that we have a lot of cases where one star had a life cycle that became a white dwarf before the other star did that. Thus, that we have a main sequence star and a white dwarf that are orbiting each other or orbiting a, their collective center of mass. Well, when that happens, we end up with a an unstable relationship, an unhealthy relationship between the two stars. Because that white dwarf now, it's not in, as incredibly dense as the neutron star, but it's still incredibly dense, is going to start actually pulling matter off the main sequence star. Okay, So here we have a, a not, not the scale picture of a star becoming, so we have a primary star and a secondary star. This, this is a smaller main, main sequence star. Okay, So let's pay attention to the star on the bottom, the primary star. This, this primary star is more massive. Think of it maybe it's the size of the sun, or maybe this one is half the size of the sun. All right? And this more massive star is going to become a red giant. It's going to have a planetary nebula, you know, last, last a few million years, and then eventually it's going to shed about 50% of its matter and become a white dwarf. Meanwhile, the other star, the smaller star, is just stable. It's going to maintain stable for quite some time. So now we have a white dwarf and a main sequence star. But then what happens then this other, this other star, this, this longer-lived star, then finally runs out of hydrogen, starts you know, becoming a red giant before it really goes to its helium phase. Well, when it becomes a red giant, it's going to become massive. It's going to, be, it's going to have a lot of gas on its outer layers that is going to be very easy to shed because it's just naturally going to have escape velocities due to its, the kinetic energy of those, those particles on the surface, which means there's going to be a lot of kind of errant matter, a lot of, a lot of gas that's really easily escaping this new red giant. Okay? Well, the white dwarf is around to start sucking it up. Okay, 
Because remember, the white dwarf is incredibly massive. We got a lot of gravity here. And so then that white dwarf starts to pull matter off of the red giant. When that happens, it can pull so much matter onto it that it reaches that critical point of having a mass that is 1.4 solar masses. And thus, it can overcome the electron degeneracy. So as it, as it starts pulling in matter, just due to the gravity, it will then create a collapse. And then you will have a type 1 supernova. All right? And they're called type 1 supernovas, not because they're the more important type, but just because they're the ones that were discovered first. And so type 1 supernovas are actually not the death of high mass stars. Those are type 2 supernovas. Type 1 supernovas, which are less bright, by the way. Okay? They're more common, but less bright. Um, and that, thus they were discovered first, hence the name type 1. Okay? The type 2 are definitely the more brighter dramatic ones. So the high mass, high, high mass star death ones. But type, type 1 supernovas, these ones that are created by hungry white dwarfs, well, they're also pretty bright. They are supernovas. They're bright enough to be classified as such. And they're, and they're the death of the white dwarf. That white dwarf that otherwise would have been stable and eventually cooled into a black dwarf blows itself up and nothing is left behind, okay? Maybe it leaves behind a small black hole. I, as far as we know, it doesn't. It just completely obliterates, throwing all of its, its matter away, okay? And that's once it overcomes the electron degeneracy, there's just a, a huge, it, there's a collapse and then a release of energy, okay? It creates a huge nuclear explosion, okay? Now, they don't all blow up into supernovas though. Because one thing that can happen in the same exact situation, the same exact dance between white dwarfs and, um, and red giants, or even sometimes main sequence stars. It's, not, it's usually the red giant that is losing matter to the white dwarf. You can have a, you can have a, a close orbit between a main sequence star and a white dwarf star. But anyway, this, this is a great example. Regardless, one thing that can happen besides a type one supernova, you can also, have a nova. And a nova is, is caused by the same effect. It's also caused by the matter pulling on to the white dwarf, excuse me, from the red giant or, may, or nearby main sequence star. But the nova is an explosion that only occurs on the surface of the white dwarf. It's essentially, there's like a kind of a ring a, that builds up around that white dwarf, a surface of matter, and then that matter, instead of kind of adding to the mass of the star and causing total collapse at that 1.4 solar mass uh, limit of the white dwarf, instead the matter heats up so hot that it, it just, it goes, it has a fission explosion, okay? So this is fission, not fusion. It has a nuclear fission explosion and it just releases a bunch of energy, a burst of x-rays, a burst of visible light, and that's called a nova, all right? The name, just like supernova, was refers to the historical baggage, the fact that when these were first discovered, scientists, astronomers, thought they were seeing the birth of new stars. That's why you have nova, which were bright, bright um, bursts of light. We thought, oh, a new star is born. And then supernova, a particularly bright burst of light. Wow, I guess a really big star was born. But now we know that both novas and supernovas have nothing to do with the birth of stars. They both have to do with the death of stars. Now, su supernova, type one, death of a white dwarf, so the death of something that's already dead, okay? And then type two supernova, the, the, the very you know, dramatic death of a high mass star, okay? Now, what about the nova? Well, the nova is a repeatable process and it's much less bright. Because again, it's just an explosion on the surface of the white dwarf. So a white dwarf could pull matter on, have a nova, release, release a bunch of light, pull on more matter, have another, another nova, and then maybe through maybe a change of the properties of the red giant that's giving it matter, then it maybe eventually go through a type one supernova. So white dwarfs can have novas, then followed by supernovas, or they can just have periodic novas, or they can have one nova and then run out of the source of matter and then never have a nova again and just be a normal cooling white dwarf, okay? But novas and type one supernovas come from white dwarfs, and that's what you need to remember, okay? All right. Okay, so last topic, the topic of gamma ray bursts, okay? Because we're talking about all these, you know, these big sources of energy deaths of white dwarfs, deaths of high mass stars. So when scientists look up into the sky, they see these bursts of energy. And one mysterious burst of energy was a burst of gamma rays. Um, the, the history here is kind of neat is I guess um, in the 60s, a satellite had been posted um, in, in orbit um, by the US in order to uh, look for um, illegal testing of nuclear bombs because nuclear explosions, fission explosions on Earth's surface release gamma rays. Um, and so we could uh, pick them up in, in orbit. Um, but then they, the, the detector started measuring gamma rays, but coming from the other side, coming from outer space, which was a surprise. We didn't know there was just 
you know, random bombardments of gamma rays. And eventually, decades later, we were able to pinpoint where they were coming from. And it's been quite a journey to figure out where they're coming from. But the fact is that these gamma ray bursts, these huge amounts of energy, aren't coming from our own galaxy. They're coming from other galaxies. And they appear to be a class of, of event, a, a, you know, a, a type, a type of um, basically um, you know, explosion um, that, is, that is just particularly large. And there's two types. So you can have gamma, these extremely luminous events can occur from one particular type of, of type two supernova. So um, basically a, um, a supernova that is, that is exploding um, due to particular properties um, of, of, a, of the star, that, you know, just a, a particularly violent explosion. We've realized that that, that is one way that, that, su that these gamma ray bursts are being produced. And the other way, the way, the way I think is it maybe a little bit more, more distinct, a way that kind of stands out in contrast to, um, to the others. Um, and let's see. Um, oh, okay, yeah, actually, let me, let me uh, phrase, I wanna get, I wanna, uh, I wanna rephrase something. Because one, the one, the, you have the short, so the longer, the longer bursts, so in terms of the ga gamma ray bursts, we have long duration and short duration. All right, so let's, so we have longer bursts, and the long bursts are caused by type one supernova. All right, so it's not it's not the the um, explosion of high mass stars. It actually is a, a rare type of white dwarf um, supernova. So it is it is a, a particular way that the husk of a low mass star can then be in a binary system and can blow up due to particular kind of particular elemental conditions. So it's a tiny fraction of type one supernovas can actually create gamma ray bursts. All right, can, but don't usually produce gamma ray bursts. And this is all kind of forefront. This is stuff that's been discovered in the last 10 years. So we're really, you know, I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll figure out more about where these are coming, coming from. Produced gamma ray bursts, okay? But then the more kind of unique type is that they're coming, um, this is a satellite that was used to, uh, to measure them. The, the longer duration bursts, or excuse me, the short duration bursts, these ones are even more energy in a short amount of time. These gamma ray bursts are actually brought on by the collision of neutron stars. Because when two neutron stars um, have, are in a binary system, they actually degrade, um, they'll actually gravitationally get pulled towards each other due to general relativity, basically the gravitational warping of space and time. Collision of neutron stars, all right? And that, when they collide together, they produce a huge amount of energy. And so the collision of neutron stars is kind of the, the really fascinating forefront of, of astronomy cause of these gamma ray bursts. We've never observed one in our own galaxy. Um, it's, it's one of the, the greatest amounts of energy that seems to be released. Um, we, they also, we also seem, there, are, there can also appear to be a case of neutron stars colliding with black holes. That also seems to maybe be, maybe be the cause, or there's a close connection between neutron-neutron star collisions and neutron black hole collisions. Um, but in both cases, there's a huge amount of energy released a gamma rays and, and just and, and unbelievable amounts of energy. And furthermore, what's interesting, what's so relevant to this, is that the real confirmation, the experimental confirmation of these type of collisions was the discovery of gravitational waves, which scientists had speculated, but they were only discovered in 2017, three years ago, was the first time that they were directly documented. And it was a neutron-neutron star collision that occurred that co coincided with a gamma ray burst, the very topic that we're discussing here, and in doing so, right, this, with the burst, that, that we were able to show that, it, that the burst must have come from that event because the, the gravitational waves came from the same source. Now, gravitational waves are like light waves. They're incredibly hard to detect. We weren't even sure they existed, but we can, now we can detect them. And it's like a whole other spectrum of, of ways or a way to look at the universe. All right, so there's a there's really kind of a neat connection between this mysterious burst of energy coming from other galaxies and really the forefront of detection devices for astronomy. All right, okay, well that brings this lecture to a close. Don't forget the main topics, white dwarfs, neutron stars. And don't forget that neutron stars are the same as pulsars, okay? All right, well, thank you so much for watching. I hope it's been interesting and I'll talk to you all later.